Confirmation bias can be a gift and a curse, right? Confirmation bias could be great if we use it the right way, but it could be a negative if we force it. And what I mean by confirmation bias is confirmation bias is when we see something a certain way because we want to see it a certain way. So, for example, when I was a newer trader, right, and, and this is, um, I, you know, I, 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 I didn't really know what trading was. So I spent a lot of time like watching, you know, my morning routine was I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd have CNBC on and Bloomberg and Reuters and all these new stuff. And I would listen to the pundits and, you know, I'd be highly influenced by what the pundits say. So in the morning, they'd be talking about whatever's happening. Hey, you know, you know, every, everyone in Europe is selling off. The dollar is strong. We got, you know, everything's going to the dollar to save, haven, risk off, you know, all that fun stuff. Right. And I would take that information and, and in my mind, I'd be like, OK, I, I can only, I, I have to buy the dollar today. Right. Because these guys said that the dollar is strong. I should avoid everything else. I should only be looking to buy the dollar. And what happened is when I would go in the charts, guess what I would be blinded to? Guess where I would be leaning towards in my analysis? Only buying the dollar. Right. Because that's that was in my, I was influenced in my mind. That was the only way to be in the market. So I would only when I would do my analysis, I would only do things that that. um What's the, what's the word I'm looking for? I would only do things that complemented what I already wanted to do, right? It's no different from you going into, going into a chart and like you want to sell something. So you're ignoring every signal that says buy because you're only looking for something that because you want to sell it. It's like being in an argument where you ignore all the facts that all the legitimate facts that are against your argument, but you pick out the ones that support it. You guys ever been there? Where you try you you try to make a case for the Dallas Cowboys being good and you ignore all the other facts. You'd be like, well, the offensive line is beat up. And that's that's all you got. Yeah. We do it all we do it all the time, right? We 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 hang on, I mean, we hang on to the the one little fact. They do it, they do it in sports a lot. I I always see this in sports when when they'll base someone on like the smallest stat. Well, they'd be like, Aaron Rodgers has 83 comeback victories, making him the greatest comeback quarterback in history. And you're like, yeah, Aaron Rodgers is the best quarterback in history because he's got 82 comeback victories. And then you ignore the fact that the reason you have a lot of comeback victories is because you were losing in the first place. So my argument would be like, well, yeah, well, he's a loser because he's always down in these games. But he's got 82 comeback victories. Well, if he wasn't down in these games, he wouldn't have to come back. How many comeback victories does Tom Brady have? Not as many because he's usually winning, right? But you ignore that stuff. So we want to be careful. And it's a tricky slope in trading because we, we want to do it. But we want, to, we want to be the ones that create our own bias based off the technicals. So like the whole IPDE process is that, right? The whole IPDE process is we want to identify and predict. When we identify and predict, what are we doing? What are we doing when we identify and predict? We're creating a confirmation bias, right? We're creating a confirmation bias. We identify that price has broken structure. We've predicted that because we've broken structure, we're more likely to continue bearish versus bullish. So in our minds, now we're only thinking, all right, look for bearish, look for bearish, look for bearish. Or expect bearish continuation, expect bearish continuation. We've created a confirmation bias. And then when we go to the next part of our, our, our process, the, the D, the decision making, we're only, we're only looking for buying opportunities versus selling opportunities because we have that confirmation bias. So it's cool in that aspect. But if we do it a different way, it could be very negative. So it's a very, it's like, it's a very slippery slope. So we, 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 we want to watch how much we're influenced. And again, this is a good example where, um, you know, Tony has done a lot of work on especially the pound yen um, and, and has looked at the power of the 50% retracement on the pound yen. And a lot of traders have been doing that as well. However, what's important is we don't want to give it more power than it deserves, right? We don't want to, we, we, we still want to be kind of non-biased in our approach. And what it looks like in this situation is I think we have a clear, you know, let's pretend we're taking targets. Let's pretend we're taking targets. I, I, I would say if, if we're building a case, right, we have more evidence that says that 382 Fibonacci retracement is probably a, a 
better slash safer, whatever you want to call it, target location. Because we got three things happening there. We have a Fibonacci retracement. We have an even handle number. We've got previous, we've got the extremes of previous inside structure. The 50% above it, we have one thing. We have a 50% Fibonacci retracement and nothing else. So it's three versus one. But we don't want to give that 50% more power just because we want to, in a sense. I don't know if I'm phrasing that the right way, but does that make sense, guys? We're not saying it's not not important, but we don't want to we we don't want to we don't want to lean towards it just because we want to. We, in a way, we want to be non-biased on, and and follow what the technicals tell us. And sometimes it can be that slippery slope of where we have a better option, but we go with this option because we think it's better or because we want it to be better um, instead of going with the, 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 the one that is more technically correct. And we, we, there's many other examples of this, um, but this, this, is, this is one where we just have to be careful because if we look at that level, I think we would agree there's not as much there. Now, we can always justify it. We can always say, well, you know, it's it's at the it's it's near one twenty three twenty five. It's at the top of the close. There's a, you know, a, a previous level from January nineteen eighty six that hit there. Right? We can always find a way to justify it to ourselves. But if we have to find that way to justify it to ourselves, that's typically not a good thing. Usually, the best decision is the one that's kind of smacking us in the face. It's like kind of like college days you take the multiple choice test and they're always like just go with your first answer right and then like you have your first answer and then you switch it and you get the test back and you're wrong you're like damn it i knew the, i knew i should have went with the the original one and you try to unerase it and you're like no no i did fill out that one and it's you know it's all weird but yeah so good good yeah so i think that's i think that's a good lesson so um again not, nothing against 50 percent. i love it i love it but in this case, I think the 3D2 is a little bit better just because we have more we have more evidence at that level. We have three things versus one thing. Uh, Roberto says, I think the most difficult part um, to start prediction without any influence of what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that could be tough. Um, what helps is, uh, do you use multiple time frames? Aussie dollars is boom, it's, it's, it's collapsing. We should be looking at that at some point. Um, but but do you use multiple time frame analysis? Here's the Aussie dollar, for example. I, I told you it was collapsing. It's down 100 for the, since what? For the day, midnight. Sheesh. But do you, do you use multiple time frame analysis, uh, Roberto? Yep. So here's something that helps me. If you're using multiple time frame analysis, you should be using a higher time frame and a lower time frame, some type of combination, whether it's a three chart or, or two chart combo. I'm not allowed to trade off of the daily, right? I cannot take trades off of the daily chart. So there's no temptation to trade when I analyze on the daily because guess what I can't do? I can't trade off of it. So there's no influence there, right? So, so when you meant influence, were you thinking influence from like the charts or like influence from like other sources like TV, Twitter, social media, stuff like that? Myself. Was it, was it like that type of influence or like just influence like like pure, pure chart influence? Where it's like you're, you, you go into the chart and you're automatically thinking about how can I trade it? How can I trade it instead of how can I analyze it? Which, which one of those? I'll bring over a range bar chart real quick. You can see the Aussie kind of when it's done today. Sheesh, look at that. Not even a lot of opportunities to get involved either. That's the thing. If you look on the range bar chart here, it's a straight move. So you can't even make a case for riding the wave somehow, in my opinion. But what? Are, yeah, what? What? What is causing the influence? Is it? Uh, is it just influence on the chart where the first thing you think about is how can I trade it? How can I trade it? Or is it, or is it over, over other stuff? For example, in the Aussie dollar, my body is telling me to sell. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's look, at the, look at the Aussie dollar and you would start on the daily time frame, right? right? Now, daily time frame is a lot different. Now, are you, if you can't trade on the daily time frame, is there anything you can do?
No, right? So there should be no temptation to trade it. Now, I know what you want to do. You're seeing, and this is kind of a, you're getting caught up in the big candle. It's called FOMO, right? Anybody know what FOMO means? F-O-M-O? Yep, FOMO means, yep, fear of missing out. So that's what it is. You're, you're seeing a massive move. You're not involved in the massive move. And you're saying, man, I should be making some money. And it gets worse, right? Because if you're on Twitter, right, you're probably hearing everyone talk about, right, all the, all the, the quote unquote um, super traders out there talking about how they caught it from the very top to the bottom. And that's just making the situation worse. You're now you're like, everyone else is doing it and I'm not. This isn't fair. The truth is everyone else is not doing it. And the truth is you're not missing out. And you know why you're not missing out? Because you're not supposed to be in this trade in the first place, right? Did anything about this, did anything about the trading situation meet your rules? That's the first thing you need to ask. And this is the whole shifting the mindset, shifting the, shifting the paradigm from from kind of being results driven to process driven, right? Process over outcome. Right? We, we need to ingrain in ourselves that the most important thing we can do as traders is take good trades. And then we define what is a good trade. A good trade is one that meets all of my rules and zero rules have been broken. So the first thing you do when you look at this chart on a daily is you ask yourself, well, you know you can't trade on a daily, so the answer is kind of already there, but you ask yourself, was there any situation that met my rules here? for how you trade. So I'll ask you, Roberto, in this specific situation with, with Aussie dollar, did, did anything meet your rules? No. So if nothing meets your rules, should you be involved? No. If you shouldn't be involved, are you missing out? No, right? Now, easier said than done, right? Easier said than done. For like, I, I go through the same thing. I'll see big moves. Like, I, we can look at the Aussie right now. And again, it's been a hundred pip drop since uh, since midnight, right? And you're looking at this, and you're like, man, wish I could have been involved in that. Or maybe there was a, an entry reason while you're asleep. And you're like, man, if I was up at two o'clock in the morning, I knew I should have woke up two o'clock in the morning because I could have got that double, that lower, lower, lower close and take advantage of it, right? We're always going to say that. We always we don't want to not make money, but we have to understand what's more important and what's more important longer picture because right because everyone bragging about catching this move this morning from top to bottom right 90 percent of them got lucky 90 percent of them are going to try to do the same thing tomorrow and they're going to get burnt right the other there's going to be another 50 percent of them that try to enter late because of fomo and then they're going to get caught in whipsaw and someone else is going to make money on their behalf right so that's the reality of it the same people you hear are getting all excited today they're going to go broke tomorrow that's just you know it's gambling Right? It's no different from the person that goes in the casino, gets lucky, wins some money. They come back the next day thinking they're good and they blow it all. It's kind of how my wife is in blackjack. right? She does really, really good. I, I'll, I play crap. She plays blackjack. I'll go to the table. I'll be like, okay, babe, you got some chips. You better, uh, you know, how about we get off that table now? And then, no, 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 I'm feeling good. And I'll come back later. Where'd all your chips go? You put them in your purse? And I'm like, no, you didn't. You, no, you Tell me they're in the purse. <clears throat> Let me see the give me the purse. Give me the purse. And you have to, you know, the 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 dealer, sir. She's like, shut up, shut up. I'm talking to my wife. You stay out of it. You stay out of it. Give me the purse. Give me the oh man, where the chips go? <laughs> that's typically how it goes. But that's what happens in trading as well. And you see these people go broke the next day. Um, so. Process over outcome is important. This, this is a normal feeling, first and foremost. So don't feel ashamed or anything like that. This is a normal feeling. Fear of missing out. Who wouldn't want to see a, a, a 100 pip nosedive and not want to be involved in it? Right? I think we all would be. But we have to value the process first, right? Was it a trade that I was supposed to be in? If the answer is no, we did the right thing. And again, this is it's part of the process. It's hard to make this shift. It's not going to happen right away. It's going to happen over time. But we have to make that shift. Process over outcome. And, and trade taking good trades is the most important thing. But from a more of a technical perspective, we, we can look at this on a daily. And our only job on the daily, or whatever, or whatever your higher time frame is, our, your only job on the higher time frame is to perform analysis and make a prediction. And for me personally, because I can't trade on a daily, this is the only time frame I'm really comfortable on. There's no pressure to like, 
do I have to wait for an entry or should I be looking for this, looking for that, or is the structure gonna hold, right? There's no pressure on the daily. First and foremost, I know that a daily candle isn't gonna close for another like whatever hours, right? 12, 12 13 hours, whatever it is, right? But my job, and, and this comes from repetition, doing the same thing every damn day for the last like 13 years, right? My job is to only do analysis. Do my analysis, make, pro make my predictions, set up my confirmation bias and decide what side of the market I wanna be on. And then once I go down to my lower time frame, that's when I'm deciding how can I attack it. And sometimes you'll see this, right? If you go back to the daily and you're looking at this, right? Is there, would there have been any reason to take a short? Would you have predicted a short in the first place here? Well, the answer is probably not, no, right? So you go down to the four hour and you see this big booming candle, it shouldn't hurt because you're like, well, that I wasn't looking for shorts in the first place. So easier said than done. Again, I, I, wish, I wish it was easy to not wanna feel that way. I, I think that's a normal human emotion. Um, you guys should just replace your heart and your brain with mechanical parts like Darren and I did. Right. Once you become completely automated or, you know, close enough, then you don't have these these emotions that you human beings have anymore. And life is simple. See, see, trade, take trade. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's normal, Roberto. It's normal. But that's that's part of the process. When, once you shift the process over outcome and you kind of you, you really understand the value of taking good trades and, and not getting caught up in the emotional trade. This is an emotional trade. This is a trade again right now where people are going to try and jump on the wave right and they're they're and they're going to be late and they're going to get burnt right we're going to see this thing reverse and then people that jumped on the wave late they're going to lose money in the reversal they're going to bail on that short position and now get long is trying to get revenge and then we're going to see that second extension down we're going to see a little bit of relief the market takes a breath <sighs> suckers traders in those traders that get suckered in right they, they were losing money when the market started going up and now they get scared, they bail on their, 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 their losing trade and they start buying because they want revenge. Those buy orders give the liquidity that the real traders need to get short again. And you see that second wave down and they make profit twice. The ones that are late, they get lost, they, they lose twice. And that's, that's how it happens. Um, but we gotta shift the process. What the number one thing we must value is, is process over outcome, process over outcome. Am I taking good trades? And remember, if, if this is not a trading scenario that you should have been in in the first place, you're not missing out. It may seem that way, but you're not, trust me. So good question. Um, let me just roll through the rest of these questions and we'll take a break here. Cody says, I was just talking to my Telegram group about this two seconds ago. Um, Cody said, you start, make, uh, you start thinking, oh, I can easily hit buy and sell when the market is falling like a knife or skyrocketing, but then you think, oh, it's... Uh, Oh, is this move over? I'm sure everyone goes to this. Yep. Yeah, we, yeah, we do. Yep. Uh, one of my buddy hit 19k on a slot machine and has been addicted ever since. Yeah. One of the best things I learned in the casino was you hit big, leave. I don't care if I draw. You know, I, I was in Vegas one. In Vegas once, right? So we I flew out. Whatever, what six hours to Vegas, whatever it is. Hit big. I just left. I'm done. I'm, I am done. My buddy's like, you came out to Vegas just to gamble for a little bit? I'm like, well, dude, I just made some money. I'm not trying to lose it all. There's plenty of other things to do in Vegas. There are plenty of other things to do in Vegas. Of course, we can't talk about that, though, because what happens is... Yeah.